Today, we're going to talk about how a top economist believes that the housing market is three to four years away from normalizing, which I don't fully agree, and we'll get into those details. We're going to talk about how in a resort town, a person making $167,000 a year can't even afford to live there. The generational opportunity that's happening right now in commercial real estate and what you don't know about doing a $44 million deal because everyone thinks about it wrong. All right, Anton Stentner podcast number 53. We're still going. It's uh, <laughs> officially over, Is 52 weeks is a year, right? Yeah, correct. It's way over a year, but still 52 weeks. That's pretty crazy. Anyways, um, what's going on in the world today? The first topic is top economist Gary Schilling predicts a considerable revival in housing activity, but it's going to take three or four years. Yeah. Tell us what's going down, break it down for us, because this is probably what I was most curious about uh, reading these notes today. So, you know, G Gary Schilling, he's probably most famous for per one of the people who predicted the Great Recession. He's like, this is coming, this is coming. So in my book, he's not one of those economists that you have to immediately discount. So when I saw this article in Fortune, I was like, okay, we got to dive a little bit deeper into this. Um, as we know, existing home sales, they just took a nosedive, right? The Fed, they ran interest rates way up. And so existing home sales, nosedive. They went back to levels we haven't seen since like 2010, you know, during the great financial crisis. Why? Well, it's because mortgage rates went to 8%. What he's doing is he's basically saying like, hey, this isn't the end of the world. And we think that the housing market is starting to already unthaw. It's starting to unfreeze. But then he caveats it. And this is, I think of most people when they listen to economic information, they hear what they want to hear. And so when they hear the word unthaw or this is getting better, they're thinking it's going right back to where it, where it was. So he caveats it. He says, this is going to take three to four years. I actually disagree with him. I think because the housing supply is so broken and because interest rates were so low for so long that he says three to four years, I think you're actually looking at more like seven to 10. This is a decade to unravel this housing problem that was created by the Fed. What happened during that era of easy money was everyone went and bought a home, everyone refinanced, and right after the easy money era, we had the COVID era. And in the COVID era, we, we told everyone something I didn't, I didn't put these dots together until this week. We told them, go home, stay home, your home is safe. And so whether they're agreed or disagreed with COVID, we subconsciously programmed the American populace that your home is safe and it's an asset and you need it for your safety and security. So I believe changing that mindset. So, cause he's talking about this idea of the lock-in effect. And I'm talking about not only the lock-in effect, but we've got the COVID mental shift effect sitting on top of it, where we told them go home, stay home, your home is safe. So now when you go to get that seller to, you know, hey, I want you to part with your 3% mortgage. I want you to move into a 7% or a 6%. They're not only looking at the numbers, but they're going, they're questioning their safety inside. They're questioning, should I sell this? Is that safe for my family? Because subconsciously they got programmed that. The lock-in effect is going to take years for it to come through and it will take lower interest rates. So we know that. And that's, this is the part where I agree with him. I just think it's going to take longer than what, what he was saying. Also, he kind of hints that, that there's going to be some type of supply that construction is going to come back and kind of catch up. I just know construction here in the Seattle Metro in the Seattle Metro, the lock in effect will be exasperated longer. This go home, stay safe effect is going to be exasperated longer because we don't have enough construction due to supply, due to demand, due to red tape and our building and development regulations. So really enjoyed this article, but at the same time, I think the Fed broke housing worse than most econ economists predicted. Yeah, you know, uh, I've talked to contractors, especially ones that were 
building homes during that crazy boom in the 2000s and then survived the Great Recession. And one of the things they talk about is how not only did we lose a lot of contractors, but we even lost a lot of people at the government level. Yeah. So the whole the whole system got messed up. And then COVID happens. And that, uh, like you said, it tells people not only is your home safe, but you probably need a home, right? Yes. Move out of the cities. Yes. Move out of your state in some cases. So think about all that mix up. We have to work through all of that. And that's why it's interesting. Like I was thinking, ooh, three to four years. But then I actually, after hearing you agree, it could be a lot longer before it gets back to normal, right? Some kind of normal, a new normal, no, nothing like before. But uh I think that it could be, people could be waiting a lot longer if they were waiting for normal to come back again because of all the variables that are stacked upon Bingo. each other. And then, of course, we talk about it all the time, the money printing, the yes. inflation, and the fact that in combination with lack of housing, we just have to catch back up. I mean, literally, people have to grow up get a job as a contractor, learn new skills, start a business and get back into yeah. the system as a, you know, like a, a servicer or a contractor to help people build homes or develop whole neighborhoods. What's funny in relation to what you're talking about. And so, you know, the editors, they cut up this crazy short from the baby boomer conversation, you know, where we had that article where they said baby boomers are to blame. And so sometimes they cut up these shorts and they cut one where it's like, Ooh, it's almost risque because they basically cut it where I say this article says baby boomers are to blame. And it's just like the opening part of it. And so then I get, get the opportunity to read the comments, but the comments is this look into the American psyche. And some go, yeah, baby boomers are to blame. Some people go, rich people are to blame. Some people go, well, it's the corporations. It's the hedge funds. Other people say it's the investors. Nowhere on the list do people actually get to the heart of the issue. They're in the emotional reasons. They're not in the actual reasons and the emotional reasons of our housing issue, excuse me, the actual reasons of our housing issue, not the emotional ones, are real specific. We lost four to five years of construction during the Great Recession where we didn't build as much as normal. During that same time period, development regulations went up. Then over the last 20, 30 years, we have not made it cool and we've taken these... Um, uh, what's it called when you're in high school and you could they want you to go do a skill or a trade? What's that called? Oh, um, shoot, a technical? Yes, like yes, like a technical school. school. Yeah. We have taken the, the, the trades and the technical schools and these work skills out of high schools. And we said, hey, everyone, go be a programmer. Hey, everyone, we need you to go to college. Especially here in Washington. Especially here Seattle. in Seattle. Yeah, especially <laughs> here. Now we have a construction industry that everyone is retiring. Plus, during that same time period, it got harder to develop, you know, regulations. It got more expensive to develop. But everyone else is looking for a scapegoat. So they say it's the big bad investors, it's the baby boomers, it's stuff like that. When at the end of the day, the root of this problem is we have to go to the government and we have to make housing more attainable from an ownership perspective by figuring out how to cut the red tape and build homes more efficiently and more affordably. Otherwise, yes, it's going to take, it could take a decade to fix this problem. And what's crazy is prices aren't going to go down. No. They could potentially go up from here. No dip like uh, crypto. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going into the numbers today, but just so you and I are on the same page and for our listeners to have a little sneak preview, King County in both the median price and the average price showed double digit appreciation year to date. King County is where uh, Seattle is. And the numbers were something like 12.3 and 15.4. That's crazy. So you're looking at the price graph for King County and you know it goes uh, December low, and it goes January, and then it just hockey sticks up for February. Insane. We'll get into that another time. But this next topic, relays right into exactly what we're talking about. So in Steamboat, Colorado, and this article was, I think it was on like... NBC News. Oh, thank you. It was on NBC News. So 
High altitude, high stakes, the battleground for affordable housing in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, or a cowboy ski town. Sounds like a Disneyland like section. They're offering a hundred and sixty seven thousand dollar salary for someone to come and work for the city. And they can't find anyone to take the job. And the reality is, is the the reason people aren't taking the job, when they ask people, like, why are you not taking this job? They say, I can't afford to live there on $167,000. It's such a high salary. Like, in my mind, I'm like, you should be able to live there. But what happened is, during COVID, people ran away to the mountains. The money printing created extra ching in our pockets, so we were able to go spread that six trillion around and buy more real estate. So in all of these, you know, mountain areas, these ski towns, prices shot up dramatically. They were saying that they can't afford to even rent to the workers that are living there. So they're taking a whole hotel. And renting the hotel to the workers so they can afford to work in the restaurants, in the bars, and at the ski lifts. So there's been a staggering 80% increase in single-family home prices in this ski town since 2020. Can anyone survive an 80% increase in home prices? No. That's one of the things that people don't realize about what COVID and pandemic and lockdowns and forced exodus and moving it happens so fast the natural kind of progression or the way people get acclimated to rising prices was unreal so there wasn't there wasn't that slow adjustment it was just quick so people were thinking huh i can work remotely so if i'm gonna go home in my downtown apartment get paid the same amount i might as well just move to this whole other state where my employer might not even know i moved yes the cost of living is way better in fact i can buy a house there right or maybe i can buy like a really dope condo like in a high rise where versus uh or beforehand that would never happen people that move there they want to stay there their whole livelihood yep. is there their their job is there their career business so you you know that, that i always actually think about this we're talking about somewhere like seattle or these major metros where the house prices are going to stay stagnant if not go up i wonder about these type of areas though because as time goes on employers want you to come back home right yeah. literally come back to the yeah. office and people go oh man it's not actually that fun living in this ski town full time i'm gonna get back there could be in these smaller communities a price adjustment oh, uh, is that happening oh so one that's not happening today two let's go back in history and i know bend oregon specifically that market really well because um my brother and sister-in-law lived there so i just paid attention to it generally speaking these resort towns uh have boom and bust cycles exactly like you're talking about something causes the influx to happen it causes a rapid rise in prices and then everyone looks around and they go man there's only so many micro brews i can drink and there's only so many jobs here and only so many times i can go to the restaurant and so In my real estate career, I've seen uh, Bend, Oregon specifically go through, you know, two major boom and bust cycles. But I actually, and I hate saying these words, it looks like this time is different because the work from home happened. We sent everyone home, right? Occupancy in office is at an almost an all time high right now. And we know some of those people won't come back to the office. And that's what's putting that commercial sector under so much pressure. And so I don't know if this cycle will be the same boom and bust in these resort towns. Some of them may experience it, but I know like Bend, Oregon, for example, during this one, the market is on fire right now, still on complete fire. And with what we're seeing right here in Steamboat, that market is also on fire. So it's bucking that traditional trend of being a tertiary market or a vacation home market in getting hit. Chelan, like by where we live, same buck in the same trend too. Still up, 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 Land. up, up. Land? Land in yeah. Chelan, up, oh, yeah. up, up, up. Yeah. You know, one of our friends doing a great development project, Jeff Latham, he had a couple lots left there on the Columbia. He had also bought one lot. A year later, he sold the same 
lot that he purchased for 120 grand more. Hmm. Okay, so you're still seeing that land prices in that Eastern Washington vacation market go up too. But not as uh, probably that's a result of downtowns being a little bit more uh, vacant and desolate, right? That's downtown housing, like single family, no. Condos, apartments. yes. Apartments, yes. One of the innovative ideas, though, that I kind of liked with this one is they called it uh, Brown Ranch Project, which is a 538 development. They're looking at basically creating a large master plan right outside the city, but buying this old ranch and putting in 2,200 housing units. So these are innovative things that cities are going to have to do to alleviate this affordability problem. If they're not going to do this, they're not going to alleviate this problem. And from what I read about these statistics, these 2,200 units, they'll get zapped up like that. So this isn't even enough to alleviate it. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, like a pressure relief valve. This is another example of how affordability is affecting areas where you, you didn't think affordability was going to affect it before. And like you had mentioned, that moving and migration has then brought in a new resident to the area. So some of the residents then complain like, well, this is affecting our old, old town feel. This isn't how it always was. And unfortunately... I think we're going to continue to see that more as as our population spreads out more than it used to. Commercial real estate tycoon says the industry is entering its final stage of grief acceptance. So what's going on here? So Scott Reachler, the CEO of the commercial real estate giant RXR, uh, told Fortune that we've gone through all the hallmarks in commercial real estate of the four stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, and now depression in 2023. In 2024, you know, he's saying, hey, now well, we've seen all these challenges. We're, we're probably starting to move into acceptance. Okay, so what happened? This is that potential banking crisis 2.0, and this is the potential real estate crisis 2.0. Why? Because there's about $4.7 trillion worth of commercial debt that's going to come due over the next few years. And then 930 billion of that, or just under a trillion of that, is due in 2024. So the banks are looking around going, okay, what do we got to do? The Fed had us at commercial debt was approximately 3%. And now commercial debt, depending on what people are purchasing, is between, you know, six and a half for a low LTV to as high as eight and a half percent. If they built a performa based on a 3% debt rate, if you double the debt rate and make that 65 or 7%, that asset no longer performs. This is why at first he's like, okay, it was denial, then anger, now bargaining, then depression, like the world's falling apart. What I think is actually going to happen is that this end of the free money era is going to reset commercial values. And that commercial has to go through some of this pain, which is going to include, and he talked about this too, the cash in refinances, the selling of assets to liquidate the investor side of the assets. And it looks like this is going to cause more local banking problems because the Federal Reserve, so today, Jerome Powell went and sat before Congress. Do you think they were nice to Jerome Powell or do you think they grilled him? So they're almost never nice to him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did they grill him? I haven't seen it, but oh, I already know it. what's going to happen. There's, They do their political grandstanding. They get up, they make their point, they grill him, and they say, why are you not lowering interest rates? Why are you not protecting businesses? Why are you not protecting the economy? Well, one of the sectors that he's currently not protecting is commercial real estate, which is then also not protecting banking. So another article that I looked at talked about they think as many as 500 local banks out of the approximately 4,200, if the Fed stays higher for longer, are going to have to get absorbed. Because as this approximate, you know, $930 billion in debt starts to come due, these banks don't have enough liquidity to deal with that. And then 
like we had mentioned before, what's happening is these banks are having to charge larger spreads in order to make up for having to pay higher deposits. So not only is lending criteria tightening, it's getting worse right now. So until the Fed lowers interest rates, this banking problem is going to continue to get worse. And one of the things he really talked about was the reality of this year is that in 2024, the commercial real estate industry is going to have to shift its models or they're going to have to face the fate that's coming. So the fate is the debt that no longer performs. So that means some of these assets are going to require cash, extend and pretend, or to be sold. Or they're going to have to change how they're doing it. So like office may have to be converted to mixed use and residential. There, uh, some of the multifamily, I mean, that's just going to get sold because there's no way to change it. But there's no way to tackle these soaring debt levels in multifamily and the more expensive debt without additional cash. So that's the conundrum. What it's also doing, though, is this is probably creating that once-in-a-generation opportunity in commercial real estate. This once-in-a-generation opportunity in commercial real estate is real simple. The bank has to charge more because they're paying more out. Therefore, interest rates have to go up right now until the Fed lowers the Fed fund rate, which means commercial assets are going to get pinched, which means commercial assets have to be discounted. So right now is that time to build up the cash, to build up the vulture fund, to look for those specific assets that have to be sold under value because they cannot cash in refi. This has not happened since 2008, 9, and 10. And remember, in 2008, 9, and 10, that was mostly the residential side. So it was very few commercial assets that this happened to. So this is a once in a generational opportunity for you to buy commercial real estate at a discount. And it's going to be a short window. It's going to open and then it's going to close because it will close as soon as the market responds to the Fed lowering rates. I have a question for you. Are you talking to investors or commercial real estate owners who are experiencing some of this stress in terms of debt loads and higher interest rates. Yes. And what is the timeline right now for the people that you're talking to? I can give you multiple examples and one of them is my own. So I'll start with my own first is I'm talking to the bank about construction loans right now. And there is a half a point to a full point in additional margin they're asking for that they were not asking for 90 days ago. So that's happening to everyone because I'm essentially what's called a preferred customer. Preferred customer is someone who's done a lot of loans with them, a lot of business, has a lot of accounts with them. So I'm going to get from the bank what the average customer is not going to get. Secondly, and what we're going to talk about a little bit later here uh, on the podcast, is that there's people's notes who are coming due who are now talking about selling those assets because their notes have to be refied. That was a conversation we just had yesterday. The gentleman said, I'm at a crossroads. I don't like the new rate. He has the equity. He has the money. So it's he doesn't like the rate. So I'm thinking I might sell this asset and redeploy the capital. Okay, another one that we've spoken with is not in the best situation. And what they said, and this is an investment group, is they said we're going to have to raise additional capital in order to keep this multifamily. So they are currently hunting for additional investors and they're going to do a cash call to the investors, but they're putting these other investors in backup position just in case. Last question then, what, what's the window of time? When, when do you think it's going to start? Is it already started? It started. And then wh what do you think the window right now, if you had to just make your best guess for when, when this is going to be critical and the best buys will be. I know like it's really hard to time anything based off of the feds, yeah. like uh, data based decisions, but what's your hunch? Well, based on the totality of the data and dear aunt Tilly's money, what we would say is it's already started and that you need to be prepared because I can't give you an exact advice. Otherwise I'd give you the winning lotto numbers. 
This is more like you need to be prepared for when the right opportunity arrives. You need to know your numbers and have the cash ready so that you can exercise that opportunity because it's going to be different based on the metro you live in and based on the pain that's being created in that area. I can tell you, though, from what I'm reading, what I'm seeing, what I'm talking with, with our investors, it's already happening. We got kicked over a deal out of um, uh, Kentucky. Uh, 74 homes, all as one giant bundle package, and having a conversation about why are they selling now? They're selling now because they're experiencing pain, and they don't want to deal with the refinance of the majority of that portfolio. That's the reason it's coming to market, okay? Now, that's in a completely different area, and I was looking at it with one of our uh, other investors who likes to you know hunt outside uh, the area, and we decided to pass on it because we couldn't quite make it pencil, but the deal popped up because of that. Now that apple may not be ripe today. So it might be a bright red apple when it's ripe and nice and juicy, and but today it might be a little bit green. So we may just need to wait and go back and revisit that deal 30 days from now, 60 days from now, 90 days, six months. And it might ripen over that time and someone else might step up and pay for that. But that's what you're looking for. You're looking for the right deal that matches your buy criteria that matches your investment goals, that you can capitalize on and execute in a safe manner. And what I mean by that is if it's safe and good today, as rates come down, it turns into a grand slam. Today, we're doing good, safe deals that turn into phenomenal deals as rates change. We're not doing risky deals and betting the farm. All right, next topic. Tell us about this $44 million deal. What do we need to know about it? It's funny. So when you go to do a deal this big, it's never what the average person thinks. It's never what the average investor thinks. It's never what the average agent thinks. So we represent our investors, and we went and looked at these two very large A-class properties, downtown Seattle. We're talking on the right street, in the right area, beautiful, primo properties. Skyscraper? Very tall. I, I'm not going to give out details. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the prod. But when they think about this, they think this is about a script, a presentation, a sales tactic. And this is where they get it all wrong. And then the next thing that happens is they get in their head and they create fear and they go, oh man, it's a $44 million deal. It's just extra zeros. They end up creating their own objections for themselves and then they tell themselves they don't know how to do it. I'm going to be blunt with you, with my hardcore investors, with our audience. This is why you subscribe, by the way, is a $44,000 deal is the same as a $44 million deal. You're just getting the two of them confused. And what you have to do, though, is you have to be able to speak their language. So you can't just fake the $44 million deal. There is part of it where you have to understand financials. You have to understand how buildings operate. You have to understand the emotion and the logic behind it. But you also don't have to have every part of it figured out. Individuals at this level who own these size of portfolios, they don't have to sell. It's not about the money. So pause on that. Let that sink in. When you do a deal this big, it's never about the money to that person unless they're in some type of distress. And this was not that by any means. Because when they have these big, beautiful properties, everyone calls them. Everyone wants to buy them. Everyone wants to list them. And when they build these big, beautiful properties and operate them, everyone in town already knows them. So what they're doing is then they go, they've got their whole team of advisors. There's a team of experts that show up. And sometimes they're people out of the C-suite. And sometimes they're financial advisors. And sometimes they're construction people and lawyers and attorneys and accountants. So here's how it started. The first one was a Zoom meeting. It's just a meet and greet. Some of the people were asking, like, well, what is this deal going to be? I was like, actually, they're checking our temperature to see if they like us as humans, to see if they can do a deal with us, 
and they would want to do a deal with us. That's all this first meeting is going to be. So we get on the Zoom, we have the conversations, we all smile, we laugh, we talk about friends, we talk about family, we talk about life. Wait a second, isn't this a $44 million deal, Anton? Yes, this is how they're done. Then next what happened was after we passed the first test, and there's people on the Zoom who are not on camera, who are not talking. They're just listening. They're probably taking notes. They're interviewing you and you don't even realize you're being interviewed. They're probably Googling you in the background and sending messages uh, uh, to the people. So be careful what you post on your social media. So next, they're like, you know what? This was really good. Let's set a lunch meeting. So we go to the lunch meeting. We sit down. We break bread. We've not talked about price. We've not talked about terms. We've not talked about anything more questions about building the relationship. So this is the part that people miss. When someone is an ultra high net worth individual who owns a whole bunch of properties and they want to do a big deal, they're not going to sell it for money. They're going to sell it because of a relationship, which is Ford, family, occupation, recreation, dreams. We talked about life. We talked about cars. We talked about politics. We talked about our kids everything. So we got interviewed to see if, you know what, would I like to sell this, these two buildings actually, to these people. We built a relationship which created this opportunity. And after looking at the buildings and after talking about this, at the end of everything, as we're saying goodbye, well, boys, did you like it? Yeah, we like it. Do you think your investors would like this? We think our investors would like this too. Excellent. You know, we'll send you some financials, then we'll go tour the, uh, the second building, and we'll see where this goes. No promises, no deadlines. Hey, we'll just take it nice and slow. That's the other thing. It moves slow. It moves at their pace because you're building a relationship, you're hanging out, you're talking about cars, you're talking about food, and if... You pass all of this, then you get to the business part. So like most things in life, and this is why I wanted to boil it down, if it's a $44,000 deal or a $44 million deal, it's about understanding people and building a relationship first and then the business second. Phenomenal meeting. Phenomenal meeting. So what I heard from you was kind of two sides to this uh, advice. One side is don't be intimidated by the numbers because it's the, the same equation, right? It's yes. this rate of return or, you know, um, what people want to get out of it. What's their motivation? The second part, though, the biggest difference is somebody that's selling their one house and going to move to another city and needs to buy another house. They need to do it quick. Yes. You know, this may be their only real estate. It's just a quick transaction desired because there, yeah. there's just it's it's a. Uh, it's not really an investment for them. It's just a necessity and they're just moving on. And that's kind of most all residential. The bigger deals, like you said, not only is it slower, but they have the money to just kind of like let it drag out because you're probably also more discerning on who they work with. Yes. And then also the price that they sell, they have to make bigger considerations. And then also a lot of the people that have a lot of money, the question is where do they park the money afterwards? What's the next kind of vehicle that they're going to place it in. That, that You just nailed it so good, and I can tell that you've played the real estate game with me. You have to ask them, what's your next plan for this? What are you going to do with the money? And in this particular example, part of it actually was just sheer legacy stuff, where they were going to impact the community if, no, and this is still the big if, this deal did not happen if they sold it. And then realize on our side was also a team. So it wasn't just Anton. There was a team of us that showed up too. So there's always like a group and a group that show up for these really big deals. But also when the deals are this big, who cares? There's enough to go around. Um, the other part is like you, you just want to operate on their speed. If they want to go fast, go fast. If they want to go slow, go slow. 
Just let it work naturally. And if it doesn't, that's fine. Your goal is more to build the relationship so when the time is right, that you can do business with them in the future. Make it all about the relationship and doing good and doing right. Uh, and then you'll be able to possibly do more. Or if nothing else, I mean, one of the things that all of us chatted about yesterday was like, I think I learned something on that appointment. Because when you meet people who have done something big, they have amazing insights to share. So, you know, part of it, I just show up like a little boy. I'm like, oh, just curious what's going to happen. You just ask good questions. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's more of a people game versus a price game, even though price is going to be a consideration. Price will always be a consideration because it's a business deal at the end of the day. But it's people first. And then it's what, then it's the relationship. And then it's what do they plan to do next Cool. Now, can I build a bridge, a roadmap, a plan that can help them get from where they are and satisfy their long-term goal? And if you can, then that's where you do awesome deals. I think that for the seasoned investor or people that do this for a living regularly, maybe not as much um, of the case. But for somebody maybe that doesn't have a lot of experience on the ownership side, um, as an investor or a uh, agent that serves commercial real estate or bigger projects like this, also helping them with the other side of it too, yes. right? So that question not only tells you what their motivation is so that you can talk the right talk, but what if you have a project for them to move Bingo. to, right? Like they want to make a bunch of cash. You know, the, the thing I remember when I was an agent is what do you want to do with this cash? Yes. Like, why are you selling? Because then that tells you a little bit about their timing motivation, pricing motivation, and then their real motivation. I mean, those can all be the same thing. But then for these bigger projects, say you do have a whole portfolio of different things going on. Maybe maybe they're like, you know, I just want to get out of this state. I want to go to a place yeah. where there's better policies. Um then maybe you do have some connections other state. And so that, you know, like if they're interviewing a whole bunch of people, it's like, I like this guy because he's also going to help me on the flip side, right? Like on the other side of this transaction. No, how often is that the case? And then two, when do you know that's something you should present? You have to present it every single time. Oh. So let's take this like three levels deeper. You cannot help someone if you don't understand kind of their mental pricing model, the time frame they want to do it in, and then their motivational factor for why they're doing it. With all of that, you then have to be able to look 100 yards down the field and say, and what's the dream? What's the goal they're trying to accomplish? And then help them drive towards that goal and that dream. Because when they're driving towards the dream, then they've got the emotional pull. And that emotional pull moves them forward. And that, if what's so funny is that it doesn't matter if it's a $44,000 deal or a $44 million deal. What that emotion pulls them through. Logic makes them think and emotion makes them act. So you have to have the emotion to pull them through to the other side of the real estate transaction. Um, we made it under an oh, hour today. We, we, made it, <laughs> we made it under an hour. So, you know, we do need your likes. We do need your subscribes. We do need your comments. But I also need you hunting for deals. This is deal season. Deal season is upon us. And it's upon us because of not everything's perfect. When you are in turbulent waters, it is deal season in real estate. Happy hunting. Go find something. Let's go do a deal together. I think the next episode should be how to hunt for deals. Yeah, let's talk about well. deal hunting. <laughs>